In the city of Chicago, the life expectancy of African Americans is alarmingly low. Why is that? What are we doing about it? I'm Sylvia Snowden, and this is Critical Condition. One of the more eye-popping numbers in the 2021 State of Health for Blacks in Chicago report was 50%. That's the percentage of HIV patients in Chicago who happen to be black, 50%. So how have we responded to that? What's been done to support a community in the throes of fighting off what we know to be a deadly illness if left untreated? Well, to help us work through some of that is today's very special guest. Before I get to them though, I should say that I'm Sylvia Snowden. I'm a very proud employee here at KNTV and I'm thrilled to welcome to today's program, the journalist, Adam Rhodes. Hello, Adam. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It is my great pleasure to have you because you have done some phenomenal reporting that you have agreed to sit with us for a few minutes and discuss. So we thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so you wrote for, for the, the Chicago Reader, I understand you are a social justice reporter there, correct? Yep. Okay, so, so you wrote an article, fantastic article, The History and Harm Behind Illinois' Criminal uh, HIV Transmission Law. And, and I, I have to say, I was blown away when I read it. I mean, it was really startling, frankly. So I, I, if you don't mind, I just kind of want to jump right in because there's a lot to go through. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. So now you open your article with a gentleman named Jimmy, I, 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 I do not want to say it improperly, Jimmy Amutabi, correct? Yes. Okay. I got it right. Um, tell us a little <laughs> bit about Jimmy. Um, what should we know? Who, who, who was, who is Jimmy? Um, so Jimmy is a um, a relatively middle-aged uh, Evanston resident. He's a black man. He moved um, from Kenya when he was, um, I don't know, the. I think it was about uh, 13 years ago or so. I don't know that exact number. Um, but And up until recently, up until 2016, he was a proud personal trainer. He's a father of a young son, and he's a husband as well. Okay, right, but, but but something happened between Jimmy and the Skokie police in 2016. What happened mm -hmm. then? So essentially in 2016, he received a call from the Skokie Police Department that he had been accused of willfully withholding his uh, HIV positive status from uh, women that he had slept with. Okay, so and just to make sure everybody at home was, was clear, he, is married to somebody, but the police call him and say other women who are not his wife have complained that he was sleeping with them and didn't tell them that he had AIDS or HIV, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, and, and, and how did this information come to the Skokie Police Department's attention? Um, so a woman that Jimmy had a relationship with um, had brought it to the police's attention um, in Jimmy's words to retaliate for a failed relationship. So according to Jimmy, they break up, she calls the cops and says that this person had HIV and didn't tell me. Yes. Okay, N now how did she find out that Jimmy had HIV? D did, did he tell her, hey, I have HIV? Or how did she find that out? Um, he says that he told her that, she had, that he had HIV. Okay, okay, okay. And, and now she wasn't the only woman who came forward. There were multiple people who came forward, correct? Yes. Okay, D did he tell them too, or, or how did, did they get into this? Um, so as part of the retaliate, the alleged retaliation for the failed relationship, the woman, um, Jimmy says, like got his, um, had access to his phone and went through his contacts to find um, other women that he had relationships with. And disclosed someone else's HIV status. Yes. Which is not legal, correct? Uh, I don't, in her case, it was, it might have actually been illegal because she also had a job that allowed her access to medical records. So mm -hmm. in that case, it might've been a violation of HIPAA um, but in that, um, just person to person, it's, I don't believe it's actually legal to do that. Okay. Okay. So, and, and that's, uh, fascinating because <laughs> we have sort of a, a chain of events th that results from th this woman making this call to the police. Um, the first of which being the Cook County state's attorney decides to charge Jimmy with a crime. What, what was Jimmy charged with? 
So Jimmy was charged under the state's now uh, repealed HIV criminalization statute, which makes it uh, a felony punishable up to seven years in prison for knowingly withholding um, someone's your HIV status um, in a situation where transmission can occur. That was something that I really wanted you to sort of explain to viewers, to people who may not understand. Uh, under what circumstances is the transmission criminal? Is it just if you don't disclose, or let's say that you do disclose, but you have an unprotected sexual encounter, when is transmitting HIV criminal? When does it rise to the level of criminal behavior? Yeah, so it rises to the level of criminal behavior when it is uh, HIV status under the law was knowingly withheld. It's, um, so the, the, def the defenses available under the law are primarily disclosure of HIV status. Um, as well as like measures of protection against HIV transmission. Okay, so <laughs> I, I don't want to say this, keeping in mind the fact that I'm an '80s baby. So, so I realize that there's an entire generation yeah. of folks behind me who is not really familiar with uh, mm -hmm. AIDS panic of the '80s and '90s. So, can you maybe explain to people at home? what it was like in the 80s and the early 90s when it came to AIDS and HIV. What was that AIDS panic like? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, all of the like misconceptions that we have about HIV and AIDS are from this era, the, the idea that it's this horrifying virus. Those comments are rooted in this, in this stigma and the panic of this era that, you know, you die in two to three weeks of AIDS, which, I mean, death was rapid and quick and painful in those days, but now it's, now we have, there are a host of medications and treatments available for people living with HIV. Um, but in that era, there were ineffective treatments. There were treatments that would like help your condition, but not like improve it or not um, like completely make your situation like livable. Um, it did feel like kind of um, plugging a dam with your finger in a way, like the state of HIV treatment at the time. And so I think that's what all of these laws are really based around the like idea that this is a like quickly spreading, um, massively deadly virus that needs to be contained as quick as possible. Yeah, I mean, and that certainly is not something to be overlooked here, that there was a time when an HIV AIDS diagnosis meant certain death. And as you mm -hmm, said, absolutely. maybe, you know, there was something that could be done to maybe give you a little bit more time or, or ease your symptoms. But back in the day, mm -hmm. in the 80s and the 90s, if you caught HIV, you were just... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you at one point, um, a 21-year-old gay man diagnosed with HIV at the time, the life expectancy was 32. Wow. So it was um, like just 11 years after diagnosis. And now I believe that number is up to 71. But I remember like the early 90s being when Magic Johnson made his announcement. I feel like you talked a bit about this. I was six. Yeah. But even mm -hmm. then, like I remember everybody just being ridiculously panicked. And, mm -hmm. you know, if a six year old could feel it like it was palpable to someone like yeah. my age, then I'm sure that, you know, everybody else, like older, sexually active, yeah. definitely picked up and was just, you know, frightened out of their minds. Yeah, totally. I um, I mean, I talked to somebody, it was in the article, Bill McMillan or whatever. He, like, he was a founding member. I don't know if he was a founding member, but he was a member of, like, Act Up Chicago. Um, and he protested this law because he was just like, no, I remember I had gotten diagnosed with, he had been diagnosed with HIV, like, a couple years prior and he's like no we were all terrified he's like at one point like you wouldn't even like kiss anybody in a bar because you didn't know like what was going to happen um, yeah and i it think was wild. no it's, it's even interesting like what we're seeing now like with COVID, like when people aren't really educated on the way it spread like you know what we know this year compared to what we know last year i feel like yeah. it really helped to cut down on some of the panic and the white noise and misinformation that people are actually informed about you know oh, the spread but when, when, when we don't know, and we're still figuring all that stuff out, panic just mm -hmm. ensues because folks don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, imagine like, I mean, for how like up an arm and like how much everyone is in a frenzy now, like imagine if COVID like killed you in two weeks, like it did, like HIV did, like 
that would be terrifying. Like there, you know, there was no like long HIV. There was like, you had HIV and then like you weren't there like a month later. And, and there's like so many stories from that era of like, oh, I have friends who like went to like 20 funerals or whatever, like, like entire like communities were decimated. But so like, it's yeah, wild. yeah. And not just like, the, you know, being dead, but the way in which you died, I feel like people like because of the, the impact it had on folks appearance. Yeah, I feel like that, that, just, that just kind of added, a, you know, another mm -hmm. layer to the panic because folks saw like, you know, it, it really tore you up. Just, yeah. And so a lot of states felt like they had to try to respond to this illness. So, so tell us a little bit, a little bit about what Illinois did to, to respond. So Illinois, um, as well as a number of other laws, there was a, an ill um, or short-lived law that actually married couples in Illinois had to get tested for HIV before getting married. Um, but this is probably the most controversial law, the HIV criminalization statute, where um, it essentially mandated that people disclose their HIV status or could be sent to prison for it. So you, if you had it, you had to tell anyone you had a sexual encounter with that, that you had it? Or was, was it just sexual encounters? Or was it any sort of encounter? Because, you know, at that time, there were a number of ways it could have been spread. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the law in Illinois particularly points to condomless sex, okay. um, as well as um, drug paraphernalia used, particularly needles, like things like that. Huh, so, okay. Do you know who was typically charged with criminal transmission here in Cook County? Um, in Cook County, um, the law was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly applied against uh, Black people. I think about two thirds of the people charged under the law were Black men and across gender lines, it's about 75%. Huh, so, so, so in a city where, where half of the people who have HIV and AIDS are, are, are black, that this law was overwhelmingly used to prosecute them for, for criminal transmission, correct? Yes. And, and I thought that one of the things that you mentioned sort of talking about not just history but harm was the fact that, well, and I'll let you sort of talk more about it. Um, when papers get wind that, that someone has been charged with criminal transmission of HIV, how are those stories typically framed? Um, so it's almost, um, I would actually say it's always um, framed around that like this person is dangerous, this person is a disease spreader, this person is like intentionally trying to spread HIV, that they are this um, just very dangerous member of society like out here trying to infect people. Um, but I think as Jimmy's case showed, I mean, that's how people wrote about him, but it, the charges against him were eventually, the charges against him were eventually dropped and his case was expunged and so I think a lot of the time that's what people are quick to jump to without any like further interrogation. Yeah so and, and let's talk a little bit more about, about Jimmy right here because his incident according to you did end up in the paper correct? Yes it actually it appeared in the Chicago Tribune as well as the Seattle Times and the Associated Press. Yeah and was there any fallout for, for him any personal fallout once this ended up in the paper? Yeah, he, because of the charges against him, he actually had to leave his career, his personal training career and just find a, jo find a job where he could just like keep his head down and um, make a living for his family. He had to leave and he was very, very passionate about personal training as well. He had um, kind of developed that interest from when he was a teenager back in Kenya. And it was um, a really significant loss for him to have to leave that passion behind. And, and did Jimmy ever talk to you about the impact that these charges had on his personal life, sort of beyond losing his job? Because you said that he had a wife and he had a family. Did he talk to you about that at all? Yeah, he, um, you know, his family stayed together and he was able to kind of have like that grounding and that security. But um, it has very deeply personally affected him. You know, pretty much every time I spoke with him, he got like very emotional talking about the case. He um, says he's in therapy to deal with like the post-traumatic stress and the anxiety and the depression that all of this has put him through. I mean, like his private medical information was sent around the country and he had family back in Kenya who even saw it. So to say that it had um, monumental personal impacts would be an understatement for sure. Huh. And so this is what I thought was very fascinating. You say that you have 
a, a law or that is overwhelmingly used to, to criminalize the behavior of black AIDS or HIV patients. Um, and then when the media gets a wind or hold of it, it sounds like it's then used to sort of further vilify these people because they end up like, like Jimmy did in the paper and everyone knows and you know careers and lives are upended. But the kicker in all of this, um, <laughs> was Jimmy actually even able to, to spread HIV at the time that he was charged? Yeah, that's actually a really good point because he wasn't because he was taking HIV medication, which um, the current the current science of HIV tells us that it's impossible once you're virally suppressed to transmit HIV, and that's without a condom, and that's with like any other measure measure of protection, just like HIV medication, viral suppression, and you can have condomless, unprotected sex um, and not transmit the virus. Huh. But, but, but despite that, you say he was still charged with this, this crime. Interesting. Um, yes. so, um, now in, in your article, you also talk about, um, a, a lady named Tammy Hart, whose, whose mm -hmm. husband died of AIDS. Um, but, but Tammy thought that while her husband's death certificate may have said AIDS, she had her own theories about why he may have succumbed. Can you talk a little bit about what she said about what she thought really killed her husband? Yeah, totally. So um, her husband uh, died of uh, a few common complications related to AIDS, um, which is usually how the death is referred. It's pneumonia, kidney failure, things like that. But what she spoke very plainly about was the barriers that he faced in getting meaningful treatment for HIV and AIDS, things that would have a prolonged his life, probably saved his life. And that's things like stigma and shame and I mean, all of the things that we think would prevent somebody from getting, um, from even understanding their HIV status. Now, I, I want to address this too, because I know there are people who are going to see this segment and say, hey, listen, if you're sleeping with me and have HIV and don't tell me, you should go to jail. You, that, that's where you deserve to be. What do you think sort of based upon the research that you've done, people who think that way have missed? Mm -hmm. So what these laws, I mean, these laws are aimed at stopping the spread of HIV, of, you know, getting Illinois to that, um, stopping the spread of the epidemic by 2030, um, which are all obviously very admirable, admirable goals. But what these laws actually do, um, and studies have shown this, that they decrease access to testing, they decrease treatment adherence, um, because, you know, if you don't, know your HIV status, then you can't be prosecuted under this law because you aren't like knowingly exposing people. And so there are myriad better ways to handle a public health issue than simply criminalizing people for um, engaging in behavior that may or may not result in transmission. What do you think people misunderstand generally about HIV and AIDS and still makes it so, so stigmatized? What do you think folks have missed? Um, I think the biggest thing that people miss is that uh, HIV and AIDS does not only affect queer people. It's not only gay men that um, are living with HIV. I mean, you know, Tammy is in the article. She's a woman living with HIV. And then I also think that um, people just haven't really moved on from that 80s mindset of what HIV and AIDS are. People think that it's still a virus that will kill you in two to three weeks. It is still a virus in their mind that affects only or mostly gay men or like the people like coming from Africa, all of those like misconceptions that we have about HIV and pretty much none of those are true to this day. To, to your knowledge, and maybe you don't know this, is there any STD that kills you in two to three weeks, any of them? No, not at all. Okay. I mean, not to my, I'm not like super up on that, right, but like right, I've right. never heard of it, certainly. Okay, I, and I just want, want to clarify for, for, for the folks at home that, that is, as far yeah. as, right, we, we know that there is no STD that, that will kill you in two to three weeks. Okay, so, mm -hmm. um, and, and there is, as you also alluded to earlier, a bit of an update to, to this story um, mm -hmm. that has, I guess, a lot to do with State Senator Robert Peters and then Governor Pritzker. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that update and what's happened? Yes, Governor J.B. Pritzker signed um, a bill sponsored by Senator Robert Peters and Representative Carol Amons, and that actually repealed the state's HIV criminalization statute entirely. 
Um, and that's actually really significant because as a couple states around the country have um, amended and like modernized their bills to like require the intent to transmit the virus and stuff like that, um, Illinois is only the second state in the nation to outright um, eliminate HIV criminalization as a whole. And that's just after Texas. Did you think that the law had done anything to slow the spread of HIV here in Illinois? Was this law effective in stopping unprotected? Uh, absolutely not. Okay. I would say that um, it likely stopped um, the public health, or I think it absolutely hindered public health efforts to stop the spread of HIV. I think it had the opposite effect. Okay. Uh, do you think that this law, based upon your research, was used to criminalize African Americans? Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Would you say that this law was used to, to maybe also vilify the LGBTQ community? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. And, and so what do you think the biggest change sort of will be to, to, to the lives of people like Jimmy who find, who found themselves rather criminalized for having had sex with people while HIV positive? Yeah, unfortunately, there isn't a ton of relief for people already charged under the law, but I know this is going to, I think, provide a lot of security, at least um, like mental security for people living with HIV, that they are not um, going to be subject to, I guess, like the whims of their sexual partners if they, um, and they have a right to privacy now. Okay, so as we begin to wind down here, is there anything that you'd like us to know about this law that perhaps we haven't discussed yet? Yeah, I think the history of the law is actually, is probably one of the more interesting things about it. Um, Illinois law was actually, was used to, in other states as reference for their own HIV criminalization statutes. And the woman who sponsored and eventually passed the HIV criminalization statute in Illinois had a hand on President Ronald Reagan at the time's Presidential Commission on AIDS. And President Ronald Reagan is the president who, during the AIDS crisis, is infamous for ignoring the crisis and letting more than, I think it's 100,000 gay men die before he really did anything. Yeah, so, so tell us a little bit more about this woman responsible for sponsoring this legislation, because I thought she had a very fascinating story. Tell us about her. Yeah, so it is uh, Miss Penny Pullen, who, yeah, she was an absolutely fascinating character to really dig into. Um, she, I think, um, over her overarching career was made in, like, reproductive rights and anti-abortion, but she really cut her teeth, like, in her early days as a legislator, sponsoring um, laws that were a very draconian response to the HIV epidemic. She was the one who also sponsored the uh, bill that required married couples in Illinois to uh, have an HIV test. Um, and so again, she was a member of the Presidential Commission on AIDS, and she was also um, the person responsible for bringing up HIV criminalization to the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is the, this very, very conservative group of business owners and lawmakers, and they send a sample legislation around the country and it was because of Penny Pullen that they introduced HIV criminalization in its like AIDS policy package back in the 80s. Okay, because Illinois was really one of the first states to put an AIDS criminalization law in place, correct? Yep, it was in 89. So it was actually really, really early on in the AIDS crisis in the United States as well. Yes, and so, and so then, as I think you said a moment ago, we sort of became a model for, for other states mm -hmm. yep. around the country in terms of how you can criminalize HIV. Yes. Correct. Um, yeah, absolutely. A, um, a professor I spoke with, um, he's mentioned in the article, Trevor Hopp, he wrote a book that really goes like super, super in depth about this. But um, I think it was legislators in, it might be Nevada and Alaska that actually like either spoke with Illinois legislators or took a look at the actual HIV criminalization bill to really get a sense and like to model their own legislation. Okay, okay. And, and I, I appreciate you sharing all this with us because what it sort of sounds like based upon what I'm hearing is that you have a community of folks, at least in Cook County or in Chicago rather, who have this disease more than anyone and they have frankly less access to care um, than anyone yeah, to, try to, to try to, 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 to get treated. So talk a little bit about that angle and how perhaps access to care may further 
not even stigmatized, but make it more difficult for people to, to get treated or to, you know, slow transmission. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, as uh, one of my sources, Kenny and Farrow, like uh, mentioned, you know, there's this myth that everybody has access to HIV treatment, that everybody has a way to get the expensive medication or to get on PrEP, which is a medication that if you're not HIV positive that you can take to prevent becoming HIV positive. Um, but that's not true. There's so much health inequity in the United States that, um, and I think it's no secret and I think it's no coincidence, the fact that the people who were most impacted under this HIV criminalization law are also the population that is at greatest ri greater risk of um, contracting HIV. Yeah, and I feel like I read the article, and perhaps you can talk a little bit about this too. You, you know that that yeah. that once these sorts of things make it out there about you, it's kind of hard to pull them back. Like there's nothing stopping mm -hmm. somebody from googling your name maybe ten years from now and seeing a mugshot connected to HIV transmission. I, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was exactly what happened in Jamie's case. It's I mean, it's twenty twenty one now, and um, up until he applied for that like mugshot exclusion from the Tribune. That's what came up when you Googled his name. It was his mugshot and then a bunch of news articles about it. Huh. So is there a way, because I think you touched on this in your article too, if you have <laughs> had your mugshot um, taken and then published and associated with this law, is there a way to have that scrubbed or to ask these publications to take that down? Yeah, it's really dependent on the publication, unfortunately. I think, um, you know, as news organizations kind of continue to grapple with their role in exacerbating issues like mass incarceration and like racist police violence and things like that. I think a lot of places are understanding that like mugshot galleries are um, unfair to the people who are photographed and but only a few news organizations are really providing avenues for those people photographed to then get those photos taken down. Um, so the Tribune thankfully offers a way to do that and then took Jimmy's mugshot down. But if the Tribune didn't have that avenue, there would pretty much be no way for Jimmy to get his face off the internet like that. And, and just to clarify for viewers, in case there is somebody at home who finds him or herself in the situation, um, how, if you're on the Tribune website, how do you get yourself off? Do, do you call them or email them or what happens? Yeah, I, all the details are on the Tribune website, thankfully. It, it's actually a pretty straightforward process. I think you just like shoot them an email and say like, I need this mugshot taken down, this is why, and that was it. It was my understanding to be a very simple process. Okay, okay, okay. Well, we like simple here um, <laughs> at Can TV. So, so thank you so much. Again, Adam Rose, social justice reporter for the Chicago Reporter. Phenomenal reporting. If you have not read the article, I implore you, urge you, <laughs> seriously, seriously, strongly advise you to go online and check it out again. That's the history and harm behind Illinois' criminal HIV transmission law. Uh, Adam, again, we thank you for your time. We do appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much. Of course. And to everybody at home, we appreciate you too so very much. Please do stay with us. We have a lot more to come about the impacts of black health here in Chicago in 2021. Watch the space. We thank you for your time and have a fantastic rest of the day.